Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to take a look at uh, the Percy Jackson world a little bit uh, closer in on Camp Half-Blood. So this video actually kind of coincides both with my Greek mythology lessons and with my Percy Jackson uh, The Lightning Thief reading. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of walk you through this map on the screen of Camp Half-Blood and then through the actual cabins themselves and uh, which god is represented there and then we'll take a look at the underworld. So this is just one artist's depiction of Camp Half-Blood. I believe this is the official one from Rick Riordan's website or at least it's the most common one that you'll see out there. Um, so what we'll start with is around here where this dotted line is is the property line, the border of Camp Half-Blood. And Percy enters into Camp Half-Blood on Half-Blood Hill, which is right down here in the corner. Uh, and he saw Thalia's Pine. Um, if you're curious a little bit about that and you have not read the series before, I highly encourage you to take a look at the second book, The Sea of Monsters, to find out a little bit more about Thalia's Pine then. Uh, then uh, he enters into the big house. Now the big house on this map is depicted as just a one story. You can see it looks kind of small. In the book he mentions that it's four stories. Uh, then over here we've got the volleyball courts, the arts and crafts zone, uh, the lake which has a creek that runs uh, from past the big house and then down to the beach, uh, the amphitheater, that's where they have their gladiatorial contests and their campfires, Got the climbing wall up here. Uh, if you remember, the climbing wall is kind of almost alive. It's got lava and clashing rocks and stuff like that. Grover's really great at it. Percy's not so great. <laughs> um, down here, you've got the strawberry fields, if you remember from uh, some of the earlier chapters in The Lightning Thief. Uh, Minister D. Dionysus is really good at charming fruit plants, and so they grow strawberry strawberries to sell to restaurants in New York uh, to help pay for stuff at the camp because uh, even when you're a godly camp you still have expenses. Uh, you've got your stables down here then you've got your armory in the center here that's where they would get all their shields and swords and everything. The arena. Uh, the arena is actually now that I think about it more where they would have their uh, gladiatorial contests. The amphitheater would probably be more where they have their sing-alongs. Uh, the cabins are here. We'll talk a little bit more about the cabins later on in the slide show because I've got some more zoomed in versions of those. But they are in kind of this horseshoe shape. Then you've got your mess hall here. Um, one would assume that they would have bathroom facilities somewhere around here. They're not on the map, but everybody's got to go. Uh, then you've got the creek that runs through the forest. You've got the woods here. Remember, the woods are where they do the um, capture the flag, and Chiron tells Percy that they're well stocked with monsters. Then you've got the beach over here, the fireworks beach, and Long Island Sound. Uh, so Camp Half Blood is supposed to be on the north side of Long Island, uh, well, close to the tip um, with Long Island Sound uh, on there. I am going to do another video later on after I'm done posting all of my videos of the chapters of the Lightning Thief where I'm going to take a look at this map behind me and I'll draw out their path. So I'll do a little bit more showing where Camp Half Blood approximately would be on Long Island. Uh, so that's Camp Half Blood. So sometimes when I'm reading I find it good to look at a graphic to get a little better picture of what's going on. So next we're going to take a look at a zoomed in version of the cabins. So this is an artist's depiction, as all of the things on here are, of some of the different cabins in the camp. So again, it's in a U shape with Zeus and Hera at the top, and then the, uh, with the fire in the center. Um, if you notice, you've got mostly the female gods on this side with the exception of Dionysus, and then the males on this side. They're a little uneven male-female uh, because Di Dionysus took Hestia's place. So we're going to zoom in a little bit on the different cabins. Now the 
video or the this images aren't super duper clear because it is a zoom in, um, but it's a, a good way to at least see some of the art. On Zeus's cabin, you can see that he's got the eagle up here. Um, there's the lightning bolt motif in the center. And Percy describes Zeus in here as cabins as his and hers mausoleums. They're made with marble. They've got these elegant columns. Of course, that's an architectural feature that the Greeks were well known for. Uh, over in here is she has uh, flowers and plants along her columns. Her big symbol is the, um, the peacock. And it looks like there's some sort of flower on the, on the doors, but it's hard to tell. So these would be one and two, and of course these are the unoccupied cabins because Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades made the uh, agreement not to have children after World War II, with some exceptions. <laughs> uh, and Hera is the goddess of marriage and childbirth, so she's not going to have demigod children. So those are two of your honorary cabins. Then we're going to go over to the left side of the graphic uh, to cabins three, five, seven, and nine. Uh, they kind of, if I click back, look back real quick, if we go back over here, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. So I just kind of zoomed in on one side and then we'll zoom in on the other side. So cabin three is Poseidon, and of course that was another one of the honorary cabins because Poseidon and Zeus and Hades had agreed not to have children. Of course we see Percy's a, re a, broken res a, a result of that broken premise. Uh, most of the cabins you are going to see those columns that are pretty traditional in Greek architecture. Uh, if you are interested in Greek architecture, they've got a variety of really different famous types of columns that architects study. He's got, or you've got uh, Poseidon's signature trident at the top and it looks like some sea creatures around it and um, it's blue like the ocean. And then down here at Aries Cabin you can kind of see, um, it's a little blurry, but you can see kind of that uh, barbed wire at the top. He's got the boar's head in the center of the top of the cabin. Uh, it's got, uh, it, in the book, Percy described it as a, a rather sloppy red paint job. And it looks like there's some weaponry and things like that around there as well. Then over here with Apollo's cabin, uh, cabin seven, you can see it's very gold because in, he's the god of the sun. And in the book, Percy described it as being so shiny that you could hardly look at it. Um, and it looks like there's some sort of bow and arrow motif at the top. Um, then down at Hephaestus's cabin for cabin, what are we on? Three, five, seven, nine. Okay. So cabin nine. Uh, he's got all sorts of smokestacks and stuff at the top. It is, it has the hammer and forge uh, anvil hammer and forge with the anvil at the top. The forge is that kind of anvil area. Then on the next one, we're moving over to the ladies. Um, so we've got cabin four here, Demeter. We've got the grass at the top and the tree and the plants and stuff like that around there. Then cabin six is Athena. Um, you can see her owl in the center there. Then over to cabin eight. This is another one of the honorary cabins because Artemis was a maiden goddess. She swore never to um, be in relationship with someone else. And so therefore she doesn't have children. But her hunters would stay here when visiting Camp Half-Blood. So her cabin gets used every, on occasion by her hunters. Uh, there's a bow and arrow at the top here. And you can see it's kind of a grayish, bluish like the moon. And it looks like maybe there's some deer there, too. And then uh, for Aphrodite, we've got um, cabin 10. Uh, you've got her pink, uh, long, beautiful hangings. There's flowers. There's swans. And they even make the shape of a heart at the top. Very lovely, like Aphrodite. 
Then we've got cabin 11, Hermes. Uh, Percy mentions that cabin 11 is the most similar to a traditional camp cabin. Um, it's got the caduceus at the top and just kind of looks like a regular cabin. Then Dionysus, of course, has the grape motif and vines and stuff like that. Then in the center, we've got Hestra. Hestra gave up her spot for Dionysus on the council. And in the book, Percy mentions that it looks like there's a, an eight or nine year old girl tending the fire. And so that is kind of Hestia's human form. Then moving down from Camp Half-Blood, we're going to go down to the underworld. Um, an important thing to note with Greek mythology uh, is that there's a really significant difference between our modern kind of Christian-based idea of heaven and hell versus the Greeks idea of the underworld. A lot of times when people think of the underworld, we think of it kind of as our equivalent of hell, but it's not. Um, everyone in everyone back then believed, if you believed in Greek mythology, you believed that you would go to the underworld. No matter what kind of person you were, you went to the underworld. And so there's a little bit of variation in the different spots. Um, so when you died, they believed that your that your soul would be taken to the underworld. Um, sometimes some myths uh, they would say that Hermes would take you down, or so there are other creatures who would take you down, and then you would board Karen's ferry to cross the River Styx. The River Styx is a river that um, is kind of the border of the underworld. Styx also a great 80s band. <laughs> Um, so Karen would take you across the river Styx, and then you would enter through the main gate. Uh, Cerberus, the three-headed hellhound, would be kind of the guard of the main gate. And then you would enter and go into the Judgment Pavilion. These are called the Walls of Erebos, that kind of was the secondary border after the river Styx. Uh, you would go into the Judgment Pavilion, and you would be judged by three judges. And they would look at the events of your life and determine whether you lived a good life, a bad life, or just kind of neutral. If you lived a bad life, uh, typically you would go into the Fields of Punishment. So that would be kind of that bad area that would basically be our equivalent of our modern conception of hell. Um, in the fields of punishment, you would typically have a punishment that was specific for the kind of horrible person you were. So if you were, you know, a murderer or did something, you know, really heinous, um, they, they would give you some sort of punishment that was equal to what you had done on earth. If you were truly, truly evil, you would go to Tartarus, which is down here. And that's where a lot of those monsters were trapped. Uh, that's where Zeus entrapped Kronos when he cut him up and uh, trapped him down there. So if you were truly, truly evil, that's where you would go. But most of the, the bad people who lived a really, really bad life would go to the fields of punishment. Now, if you were just kind of neutral... If you, you know, you weren't really evil, you didn't do anything super terrible in your life, but you also didn't really make it a point to help people or be a good person, you would go to what was called the Fields of Asphodel. And in the book, Percy describes that as kind of just a giant waiting room, like a big empty field where you're just standing around. So you're not really being punished actively, but you're not really being rewarded either. You're just, eh, there. So there's that in the fields of Asphodel down here. Um, it does mention or it does show Hades Palace here, uh, and then over here is the the place where you would really aim for as a Greek, um, and that is Elysium. Now I'm rather fond of the idea of Elysium uh, because if you can see from my my YouTube name, uh, my first name is Elisha. And that is basically taking the word Elysium and taking off the U-M and adding an A. Um, because a lot of times 
Elysium was referred to as the Elysian Fields, um, which is an idea that has transposed from Greek mythology into Christianity, where um, I think even in the Bible you can see passages that talk about the Elysian Fields of Heaven. Um, and my mom, being a someone who is familiar with both Greek mythology and the Bible, um, really liked the idea of naming me after the Elysian Fields. So that's why my name is Elisha. So it's a little personal note for me. So it's always kind of fun to see that. Um, but the uh, Elysium is really where people wanted to go. That's where if you were a hero or you, you know, lived your life really you know, as a really good person, you were making a lot of sacrifices, you were helping people, you, you know, you were truly good. You got to go to Elysium for the, for the afterlife. So you were still in the underworld because everybody was, but that was the paradise part of the underworld. And then if you were a hero, if you died a hero's death and you wanted to try to get to like an even better part of Elysium, a, an even, like, a, you know, the five-star resort of Paradise. Like, Paradise is great and all, but the Isles of the Blessed were, like, the, you know, the cherry on top of, of the Sunday. Uh, so the Isles of the Blessed were very, very special. And you could only reach the Isles of the Blessed if you were born if you died a hero's death, achieved Elysium, chose to be reborn again, died a hero's death, achieved Elysium, chose to be reborn again, died a hero's death, and achieved Elysium. So you had to be a hero and achieve Elysium three times in order to kind of upgrade <laughs> to the Isle of the Blessed. Which is a pretty huge deal. So, not a whole lot of population there, but apparently, from from all the myths, that was like the place to be. Elysium was great. Isles of the Blessed was even better. So that gives you a little overview of kind of what where the different areas of the underworld are, um, and hopefully that helps you understand some of the myths and things like that a little bit better. Um, and that's it for today's video. Uh, hopefully that helps you understand the Percy Jackson books a little bit better. Hopefully it helps you understand Greek mythology better. And if you have any questions about it, please reach out and let me know. Thank you.